Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Yoon Lee. I'm here today with Angela Lee for today's webinar, State of the Venture Capital Industry. Before I introduce Angela Lee, I'd like to go over a few quick logistics. As you'll see on the next screen, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you after the session. Please follow us on LinkedIn for the latest news and updates by searching for Columbia Business School Executive Education. And finally, and most importantly, please submit your questions using the Q&A box. We'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. Angela Lee is a award-winning professor and faculty director of our Venture Capital Executive Education Program, bringing 20 years of innovation, strategy, and entrepreneurship experience to the classroom. Angela is an expert on venture capital, leadership, and strategy. Angela is, a pa is passionate about entrepreneurship and has started several companies in the education sector. She, has a start she is a startup investor and the founder of 37 Angels, an investing network that has evaluated over 20,000 companies and invested over 100 startups. Angela has spoken at the White House and NASA and is a sought after expert on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, MSNBC, and Fox Business. She was recognized by the Inc. Magazine as one of the 17 inspiring women to watch in 2017, by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of six innovative women to watch in 2015, and by Cranes as notable women to watch in tech, women in tech in 2019. I'm thrilled to hand over the webinar to you, Angela. I will rejoin you in the last 10 minutes. Thank you so much, and really appreciate the introduction. Um, and so as you mentioned, I'm gonna share some content um, and then definitely make time for questions at the end. So you can throw them into the, into the Q&A window. And also there were some questions sent in beforehand by registrants and I will try to address some of them as well. So what I really wanted to talk about today was a quick sense of the state of the venture capital industry. Um, for those of you who follow the space, um, there are a lot of headlines um, flying around right now. And I just wanna talk a little bit about what's happening both from a numbers perspective, but also a little bit from a sentiment perspective as well. So I wanna to try to answer two questions in general. Um, one is what is happening to valuations? I get asked this question probably on an hourly basis at this point by somebody. Um, and so I wanna share a little bit about my perspective. And then the second thing is wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening to the industry more broadly. So for those of you who subscribe to a lot of headlines um, and you know newsletters in this space, it feels very doom and gloom. It feels like the sky is falling. It feels like you know the bubble has popped. Nobody can invest in venture anymore. Um, and I definitely don't agree. I'm actually fairly bullish on the space, um, and I actually disagree. But sometimes the headlines that are scarier get more clicks, and so that might be why you see some of those headlines. Um, it's really important when we're thinking about valuation to differentiate between early stage and late stage. I think oftentimes you hear uh, VC talked about kind of as a, as a single asset class and just say like VC is falling, VC valuations are down. And it's really, really important to differentiate between early stage valuations and late stage valuations. So the way that I would define early stage valuations and early stage investing in venture capital is pre-seed, seed, and series A. So I would say companies that are in the first three to five years of existence with, you know, certainly less than $5 million in revenue, kind of in that range. And then uh, later stage is more kind of uh, growth venture capital investing series B and beyond um, that are a little bit closer to exit. So um, a lot of you are sure are following the public markets. And so what's happening is the public market valuations are down quite a bit, just to give you a sense. If you look at SAST software as a service, which is a very darling industry, um, at the peak of the um, at the peak of valuations, revenue multiples were anywhere between kind of twenty and thirty five x. Now we're looking at between five and seven x. So that is how much things have fallen from a, from a valuation perspective. And so if you look at late stage venture valuations have fallen a lot by anywhere from one third to two third from the peak, which is about two years ago. Oddly enough, if you look at early stage investing, so people who are investing in early stage companies, valuations really haven't fallen at all. In fact, things look exactly like they did in 2021 and 2022, and they've stopped growing, but things have kind of flattened out for the last two years. 
And so I get asked a lot, you know, why is this the case? Why is it that early stage valuations haven't fallen more? Um, and I'll, I'll start it with a, a, a cute GIF. So this is a cat with a little kind of jack in the box and there's this delayed reaction. Um, and so the reason why I share this is because this is kind of what early stage is. There is a delayed reaction. And what I mean by that is one, founders are waiting to raise capital. And so what this chart tells us is how many months of capital founders are sitting on. And so what happened is typically founders raise uh, venture capital funding every year and a half, every 18 months. And then what happened is the pandemic hit. Everyone thought that venture would implode. And so a bunch of people said, you know what, we're going to tighten the belt shops. We're going to lay off. We are going to have cheaper office space. We're going to really start to cut costs and we're going to manage our costs. And so you know, we have about 100 portfolio companies. And so um, I typically get monthly updates from our portfolio companies. And it used to say, you know, we were sitting on 12 months of cash, 18 months of cash, maybe 20 months of cash. These days, I get a lot of emails from founders saying, I'm sitting on 30 months of cash. And the reason why is because people don't want to raise in a scary market. Now, notice the peak was when kind of COVID hit it's trending down. And what this means is that a lot of companies have been saying, I am not gonna go out to raise because it's a scary market. And so unfortunately, for those of you who are early stage venture investors, I do think that the worst is yet to come for early stage. Because what's been happening is that founders who raised in 2019, 2020, 2021, when things were very frothy, they were basically saying, they haven't actually gone out to raise their next round yet. And when that happens, that's when we're going to see um, early stage valuations go down. Um, the other thing is that when people talk about seed investing, you often think about a ver very early stage company. That's actually not the case. Um, if you think about the average seed stage company that's raising capital, they're over three years old, which might be surprising, right? Because seed is you know a tiny thing. It's a bud. You think, okay, this is a very early stage company. That's actually not the case. And so the bar for seed companies has been rising. And so again, even regardless of economic downturn, regardless of interest rates, regardless of COVID, this has been a very steady upward climb that what it means to be a seed company has been getting more and more mature. Another reason why early stage valuation has not come down is because venture capitalists are sitting on record amounts of dry powder. What is dry powder? If I'm a venture capital firm and I have $100 million that I've raised, um, and let's say I've only invested $20 million of that into companies, well, then I'm sitting on $80 million of dry powder. And right now, venture capital is sitting on more dry powder, more undeployed capital than ever before. And what does that mean? It means that we can keep our portfolio companies alive. So right now, we're seeing a lot of founders raise bridge rounds, extension rounds. And it means that you don't have to mark down your portfolio because I can say, look, hey, portfolio company, don't go out and raise a series A. Let me give you a little bit more cash, stay alive, and then raise a series A when the market gets better. And a lot of people have been waiting over the last couple of years to not raise because their existing investors can keep them alive by giving them a little bit of cash. Again, that's going to start to go away, which is why I think that the worst is yet to come um, for early stage investing. The other thing that's interesting is that what happened during um, the frothiness of basically like I would say 2015 to 2021 is that we had a bunch of non-seed investors investing in seed. So you had all these people who were traditionally uh, late stage investors, series C, series D investors coming into the early stage. You had private equity people coming into venture capital. You had hedge fund managers coming into, into, private, into private capital and, and venture capital. And what happens is when you have non-seed investors investing in seed deals, well, they write bigger checks, which dries up valuation, which makes sense. If you are sitting on a $1 billion fund, it is very hard to write a $2 million check. So maybe you have to write a $5 million check or a $10 million check, and that drives up valuations for everybody. And so um, a lot of that is going away. So as people are, um, the late stages, you are seeing traditionally public market investors leave private markets, but we haven't seen that as much as seed stage. So that's another reason, which is you still have a lot of non-seed investors investing in the seed rounds. Now, as much as I say that, you know, 
we're not seeing down rounds yet. We are starting to see them. So what this chart shows us is that down rounds are on the rise. What is a down round? A down round is that I raised my series A at a $25 million valuation. My expectation is that my series B might be at a $50 million valuation, a $75 million valuation. But instead, I go from 25 to 20 my valuation goes down. And you can see, we are starting to see down rounds creep up. Um, I just looked at Q3 data, we're in kind of closer to 20%. So we're starting to see those down rounds. Um, one of the pre-submitted questions was about how right now compares to after the great financial crisis. And so one statistic I can give you is that in 2010, which was after the great financial crisis, um, half of all VC rounds were down rounds. So 50%. And so again, I think we're going to see significantly more down rounds next year as founders who've been waiting on the sidelines have to raise, as um, founders can't be kept alive by their existing investors and they have to come out and raise again. So I think we're going to see more and more down rounds. On top of that, step ups have been getting lower. So what's a step up? A step up is if I raise my series A at a $25 million valuation and I raise my series B at a $50 million valuation, that is a 2X step up. And you can see during the height of the frothiness in 2021, we were seeing 4X, 5X markups and step ups. Now we're seeing you know, 2X, 3X, and this is gonna to continue to go down. So maybe you're able to raise a round, but not nearly at as high of a valuation as you were able to during the peak. Um, and then I realize I've shown you a lot of charts. This is the last chart I'm gonna show you for a moment. And this is um, that VCs are not returning capital to LPs. Now, so far, every chart that I've shown you, I actually am not scared by. I actually think it's good. I think venture was too frothy, valuations were too high. All of those things are good. This chart does scare me. So what this chart says that as a VC manager, right, I have to return money to my investors, my limited partners, uh, because I run typically a 10 year closed down fund. That's what venture capitalists run. And what's been happening is because the IPO market's been um, not very great, because the mergers and acquisitions market has not been great, uh, venture capitalists are not returning money to their LPs. This is bad because it means that that LP now can't reinvest that money into their next fund. And because venture capital funds tend to be 10 years on average, um, we're going to see this period um, kind of wash through. Uh, one of the frustrating things about venture, which is why, again, I showed that animal gif, is that a lot of the times there is a delay in reaction. And so what happens in one year, you actually don't see the impact in venture for two or three years, right? So the great financial crisis happened in 2008. We didn't see down rounds until 2010. Now I would say we're not gonna see things for probably three or four years. Why? Because of all of that dry powder, it takes the industry, the asset class can absorb more shocks. And so you see the impacts of an economic downturn or an interest rate hike take longer to show up in valuations for venture capital, especially early stage. The further away you are from exit, the more you're going to see a delay in that reaction. Okay, so for those of you who like charts and data, then I would highly encourage you to subscribe to Crunchbase and PitchBook. Uh, Crunchbase's newsletter is called CB Insights. And these are some of the reports that I look at on um, mostly, a, most of these come out quarterly. So if you're based in the US, then you've got the pitch book, National Venture Capital Association Venture Monitor. CB Insights does a state of the venture report, which is global. Um, and then you can see um, evaluations report as well as a, a total private market report. So if you're not only interested in venture capital, but you're also interested in private equity, that last one is a good one. Um, and what's nice is that both of these resources, PitchBook more than Crunchbase, they also do geographic specific deep, deep dives. So a lot of the questions that came in before the webinar were, how is LATAM doing? How is this one specific country doing. And so they do a lot of geographic deep dives. I just saw one on Germany. I just saw one in UK. I just saw one in Japan. Um, and so if you subscribe to CB Insights and PitchBook, you will automatically start getting those reports and they're free. So you might as well sign up um, and then you can just look at charts um, all day long. And just to give you a sense of kind of how um, private equity um, looks across the world, uh, in terms of percentage of value, in terms of dollar value, uh, North America, which is primarily the US, is between 50 and 60% of um, the volume. And then you can see uh, the rest of the world as well. 
Okay, let me do a little bit of kind of qualitative stuff. I have a couple more slides and then um, I wanna take Q&A. And again, this session is being recorded and you are gonna get the recording for those of you who um, wanted to see more of the charts that you, that you just saw. Okay, so whenever you're thinking about change to an industry, you always have to ask yourself, is this change structural or is it cyclical? Cyclical means that it's driven by market dynamics, right? A boom economy or a bust economy, rising interest rates, stuff like that. Structural is like, we really think this is a fundamental change to the market. And you have to always ask yourself, whenever you think about change, what type of change is this? And there are a bunch of changes in venture capital, right? One is who even is a venture capital investor? And more and more people are entering this asset class. I think that is a structural change, right? So the fact that you have the rise of crossover investors, which are people who do both public market and private market investing, um, I think that that's here to change. The fact that venture has grown and many more people are doing it um, and that the asset class has been somewhat democratized, I think it's a structural change. From a regulation perspective, many of the regulations over the last decade have been to increase access to this asset class. Um, and it has allowed a lot of companies to stay private for longer and longer. I also think that's a structural change. So the definition of accredited investor here in the US has expanded so more people can invest. 401ks can now invest in venture capital firms. Um, banks can now invest in venture capital firms because the Volcker rule got overturned. Um, solicitation rules have also been relaxed a lot in the last couple of years, where um, for those of you, you might be seeing ads for venture capital funds on Instagram or Reddit. That's because solicitation rules have been relaxed. Um, again, I think the fact that uh, we're seeing more and more people have access to this asset class, I do think that's here to stay. I also think that as the asset class grows, we are going to see more and more stringent needs for reporting. And the SEC here in the US, the Security and Exchange Commission has been saying, we need to see more regulation and more data reporting um, in this asset class. I also think that's structural. Um, in terms of how to exit an investment, this, this is, I think is very cyclical, right? So uh, two areas to think about are SPACs and secondary markets. So SPACs is a special purpose acquisition um, company. These were very hot in 2020 and 2021. We haven't heard much about them over the last couple of years. That felt a little bit more cyclical. Um, and then the secondary market, which is where you would sell your private shares on a secondary market. This is to me a fascinating space. Uh, like right now, the difference between bid and ask is between 40 and 50%. So if I'm sitting on a million dollars worth of private shares and I sell them on the private market, I might only get half a million dollars for them right now. Um, when I see that much of a gap, there's a lot of opportunity. That also feels a little bit more cyclical. And then how is success defined? I think that is, that is ever changing. Um, and so as you're thinking about you know, our jobs as investors, I think there are three jobs that we have as investors. We source great deal flow, we select the best ones to invest in, and then we support them through exit. And what it means to do this has been changing. Generative AI um, is obviously changing a lot of this. Um, and so what I would really encourage all of you to do as you're thinking about entering this space is to really ask yourself two questions. You know, The first question is to think, where is the industry going, not where the industry is today, because things are changing. And so think, you know, because if you're going to be in venture capital, you know, funds last 10 years, this is a long term game. So think not where is the market today, but what's going to be interesting five years from now, 10 years from now. And then think what unique value can you add to this ecosystem um, that nobody else can? Because venture is competitive. I think it's going to continue to be very competitive both to get into the industry, but also to get into the best founder deals. Um, and so you really have to think about, um, again, what you are best suited to do. So with that, I am going to dive into some of the Q&A. Um, and so um, I'm gonna try to answer some questions live and I also wanna answer some of the questions uh, that were pre-sent in as well. So there were a lot of questions on specific industries and specific geographies, and I'm not gonna speak as much to them. What I would really encourage you to do is again, subscribe to PitchBook or Crunchbase and they do industry specific deep dives. They also do geography specific deep dives. That is the best um, place. Uh, there's a question here, which is what is the use of PitchBook? And uh, PitchBook is essentially a, a database. They have both a free resource, which is the newsletter that I mentioned in the reports they do. They also have a paid resource where you can basically do research on all of these private companies. And so it's, for those of you who know Morningstar for mutual funds, that's a good analogy for what PitchBook is. 
Um, there's a question here, which is what is more important to limited partners, the return of capital at a loss or lower than expected with a higher return, i.e. delaying liquidity to capture expected returns? I think that most people are, want returns over liquidity, right? While it's good to get money back early, I think at the end of the day, those of us who are money managers, we're putting two to 10% of our money into venture capital. And this is speculative high return. And we would much rather have the opportunity to hit a 20X company than to get our money back sooner. So I think most people are gonna prioritize uh, returns over um, liquidity. Um, I wanted to answer one of the pre-sent in questions. And so one of the questions that got sent in was, um, how are some of these trends impacting emerging fund managers? And an emerging fund manager would be somebody who was a first time fund manager. And so what we saw between, you know, 2000, the entire kind of last decade is we had an explosion of new fund managers. So we've gone from a couple thousand VC firms to close to 10,000 VC firms. And a lot of that is through emerging fund managers. And so the good news is, is many more people have the ability to launch a venture capital firm. Also, from an administration per point, it's way cheaper to start a, a venture firm. It used to be that it was 50 grand a year to start a venture firm. Now you can probably start one for 10 grand a year on Carta or AngelList or you know, Seraph, any of these tools. The bad news is it just means it's that much more competitive for LP dollars. So one thing I'll mention is that 2023 fundraising is down two thirds from 2021. So what's happening is I think you have a lot of new people raising very small funds. So I'm seeing these micro funds emerge that are $2 million funds or $3 million funds. Um, and so, but I think it's a good thing that more people have the opportunity to be emerging fund managers. I'll share that. Okay, uh, there's a question which is, will the potential poor results from recent vintages discourage some of the new entrants to venture capital from maintaining a presence either by choice or by force? Um, yes, I do think we are going to see a little bit of a consolidation of venture. I think that we're going to see certainly fewer new funds being started. And I think we're going to see a lot of firms not be able to raise a second fund or a third fund, which means that they're going to go away. And I don't think that that is a bad thing. Um, some questions on like sector specific, I'm not going to answer as much. Um, what I will say about for those of you who are in more of an emerging market, um, and you're asking like, you know, can I do venture capital here? The question I always ask myself is, are all the players in the ecosystem there? So do you have great founders? Do you have the ability to hire great talent? Do you have access to investors at all stages? So angels, early stage VCs, late stage VCs, private equity. Do you have acquirers? Um, do you have lenders? Do you have service providers? Do you have a government which is supportive of um, innovation and all that kind of stuff? And so for me, you know, to the, to the degree that you are globally mobile and you're thinking about where to be in the world or you're evaluating your own local ecosystem, I'd ask yourself that question, which is, do you have all of the different stakeholders existing in the ecosystem? I think without it, it's very hard for an ecosystem to be successful. Um, okay, let me take another question, uh, which is around corporate venture capital. So um, there were a couple questions around corporate venture capital and the role of corporate venture capital, often called CVC. Um, so one thing to, be, to know is that corporate VCs are in about 25% of all VC deals. So it's a pretty significant part of the ecosystem. And corporate VCs are Google Ventures, Apple Ventures, Comcast Ventures, where a large corporation says, look, we have capital, we want to put into venture capital companies. And so for those of you who are either thinking about working at a CVC, thinking about taking money from a CVC, or just wanting to know about the space in general, um, I would ask kind of two questions. The first is, how is that CVC defining success? And the second is, how are they making decisions? So in terms of success, one success is they want to make money, right? They have extra money on their balance sheet, and they want to put that money to work in a hopefully growing um, asset class. Um, another reason could be strategic, right? They're looking for strategic partners. They're looking for acquirers. Uh, they're looking to hire really interesting talent in their field. Um, and so I just would make sure that I wouldn't work at a CVC or take money from a CVC unless they had a very clearly defined definition of success. And the second is how do they make decisions, right? So as a founder, 
you don't want to work with a CVC that's going to take six months to get back to you. Similarly, I think as an employee, that would be really frustrating to not have the autonomy to make investment decisions. Um, but CVC is a great place uh, to work, especially for those of you who don't quite want to make the leap to working with like a three person firm, right? It's a nice way to kind of take one step closer to venture capital while still having kind of the support um, training of, of a larger institution behind you. Um, okay, so here's a question. Would a PE firm raise a round versus sell off an asset? Can you explain why or when this would happen? So, um, first of all, let me define the difference between venture capital and private equity. So uh, the main differences are ownership percentage. Typically, VC firms are going to own about 20% of a company. Typically, PE firms are going to own a majority of a company. The second is operational management. VC firms are not going to manage the company. They might sit on the board and be helpful, but they're not going to be involved in day-to-day -day management, whereas PE firms often are. Um, another difference is holding periods, right? VC firms right now on average from when a company starts to when they exit is eight years, whereas PE firms typically hold um, ownership for much less time. So it, the question is, would a PE firm raise around versus sell off an asset? Um, if you mean a PE firm working in venture capital um, and taking a minority um, percentage, or if you mean a, v, a PE firm that owns a majority stake, I think the answer is a little bit different. I also think that PE firms often, they're going in there to say, I think I can make this company more financially efficient. Whereas VC firms are investing because they believe that there's top line growth. So the motivations are very different. And so that's the way I'm gonna answer the question. So you have, they, I think they have to look at the future of the company, right? Is this a company where I think that I can extract value, increase margins, and then sell or consolidate or do a roll up? Or is this a company that has a lot of potential future growth, in which case then they would raise another round? Um, for those of you who want to launch your own fund, I would encourage you to look at a resource called um, so Sapphire Ventures is a very large fund of funds. So they specifically invest in VC firms as a fund. Um, and they have a great resource called OpenLP. And they have, a, and, and so if you just Google mistakes first time fund managers make, uh, there's a really great article they put together specifically around um, best practices with first time managers. Carta, C-A-R-T-A, they also have a great resource on, if you just Google Carta first time fund, first time VC fund manager, you'll also get a really great resource there. Um, uh, what is my take on venture studios and fundraising opportunities for studios? So what is a venture studio? So a venture capital firm is typically giving an existing startup money in exchange for usually between 15 and 20% ownership of that company. A venture studio is going to co-build that company with you and typically take closer to 50% ownership. So the difference is quite stark, right? One is percentage of ownership difference. And then the second thing is um, the role that they play. I, I think you just have to ask yourself what role you, what you like to do. Do you like to help build companies or do you want to invest in companies? And so I think the roles are very different. Um, Yoon, I want to make sure we give you time to wrap up, and so I'm going to hand it back to you. But um, sorry if I wasn't able to get to all the questions. There were a lot, um, but I did my best. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Angela, for your time today and for all these in, in, amazing insights. Um, uh, we are looking forward to your upcoming venture capital investing in early stage program with Columbia Business School Executive Education. It's happening in April of next year. Um, in addition to Angela's amazing work in VC and her experience in VC, she's also a former McKinsey leader and teaches our Driving Strategic Impact program, and that is going to happen in March of next year. So please be on the lookout for more information about our programs in your email, and on behalf of Columbia Business School Executive Education, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Have a great day.